Could you turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of Colossians? The book of Colossians. You guys good? Welcome to everyone. Thanks, Kimmy, for the thumbs up. Kimmy's good. So, Kimmy is a friend of mine over there. That She gave me thumbs up. No, no one else did. So. It was wonderful to be with you. I'm always humbled to just share the word of the Lord with you. And I wonder if you can, <clears throat> if you have a Bible, <clears throat> sorry, if you could hold it up, maybe put it on your heart, as a, just as a, as a sign in a sense. We're just going to pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. And Lord, I pray that as we read your word this morning, that revelation comes into the hearts of people. Lord, it's not just information, even though we're going to go over some information today, but it's not just that. We need to approach your word with the author. So Holy Spirit, your word says all scripture is God-breathed. And as we read this morning, Holy Spirit, I pray that rhema, that revelation comes alive in people's hearts. Because that brings change and freedom and life. Just take a moment. Just ask the Lord. Lord, speak to me from your word this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'm going to jump right in. We're going to start, a, uh, <clears throat> we're going to go through a bit of the book of Colossians for the next however long. And uh, I don't really know how long that'll be. This is something that the Lord actually put in my heart at the end of last year. And so today will be a lot of actually just foundational in terms of historical background and, and emphasis and what they talk about, and not that that's not important, but it actually is very helpful for us to understand. Uh, it's profound to me to try to read Scripture or try to see what was happening in that day. If you've been here, you know it's important. So Colossians 2, verse 6 and 7 says this, for me, one of the root verses of this whole um, of this whole book. Sorry, my Wi-Fi is still on and people are texting me. That's interesting. Um, Colossians 2 says, as you have therefore, ha as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. The New Living Translation says, that's what we're going to read this morning. That was the New King James. Let your roots go down into him. So let your roots go down and let your lives be built on him. As your roots go down into him, what will happen is on the surface something goes up. Then your faith will grow strong in the truth you were taught and you will overflow with thankfulness. Being rooted in Christ, being rooted and grounded in Jesus Christ. And when I read Colossians, it's like Paul was writing, it's like the Holy Spirit was speaking and writing to us today in the United States. Some people, some scholars or some theologians have called uh, um, Colossians the, the when faith comes under pressure. And I'll explain why they said that in a moment. But the, the predominant truth that comes through Colossians is the supremacy of Jesus Christ. The supremacy of Jesus Christ. So I'm going to give you a quick historical setting. Colossae is a, was uh, about 100 miles east of Ephesus. It was a town actually in the valley of the Lycus River. It used to be called the Lycus River. Now it's called the Aksu River, which is in modern-day Turkey. And it was about 100 miles uh, out of Ephesus. It, it was destroyed in an earthquake uh, early in the first century AD. So we don't really have, they haven't actually ex excavated. There's farmland on there now. They've done very little bit of excavation, but there's farms on top of what used to be Colossae. And so we don't even know, was there a Jewish synagogue, was there this, what was happening? We don't know a lot about Colossae or Colossus, but it was about 100 miles outside of Ephesus. It was a much smaller town. And Paul writes this letter, Colossians, he writes this from prison. And as he wrote a few of his letters from prison, and there's two schools of thought. If you care to know, a lot of people think he wrote from Rome and others think he wrote from Ephesus. I personally think it was most likely from Ephesus. We can't prove other way. But he does say to, to uh, Philemon, he does say to Philemon, prepare a, a, a room in your home for me, I'm coming soon. And Ephesus was really close in a sense. 
would have been a couple days journey. Rome was very, very far away in terms of how they used to travel. And if it was from Ephesus, he would have written this letter about eight or ten years earlier than if he wrote it from Rome, which is important because he was, sounds to me when I read this, that he's writing this to a young church, to a church, to a newly established church, a group of people that have become saved in an ancient worldview of Greek mythology. And they are dealing with all the stuff that's going on around them. So they were facing many difficulties, many challenges. And Paul did not plant this church. He did not just start this church, but it was related to him. And what do I mean by that? In Acts chapter 19, Paul goes, uh, in, there's a revival that happens in Acts chapter 19 out of what I'm talking about, and a major and incredible revival actually. But Paul goes in Acts chapter 19 and he starts to preach to the Jews in the synagogue and they reject him after three months of being rejected. He eventually says, all right, I'll leave. And he goes to this philosopher called Tyrannus and he preaches in the school of the hall of Tyrannus for two years. And it says in those two years, he taught every day and for those two years, all of Asia Minor, which was like the bigger area, all of Asia Minor heard the gospel. Obviously, they were coming to this hall of Tyrannus, hearing Paul. Who would have loved to hear Paul preach? Yeah, that would have been wonderful. Hearing Paul preach, and it is assumed, and there's a lot of evidence for this, that this guy by the name of Epaphras, who was a young Greek guy, he went to the hall of the school of Tyrannus, and he heard Paul preach. And he got radically saved, and he went back to his small hometown in Colossus, which is on a river, a beautiful area, uh, and he went back there, and he started to tell people about Jesus Christ. And out of that, a church was started. Out of that, a group of people started to gather. So Paul has never been there. But Epaphras then goes and gets imprisoned for preaching the gospel, and he actually gets imprisoned with Paul, which is another reason I think he's writing from Ephesus. It was close. He gets imprisoned with Paul, and he starts to speak to Paul and tell him, I have these concerns for this church. I'm concerned because there was some doctrinal stuff that was starting to come in. It was like there was this young church, and then the people or the person who was instrumental in starting that work was suddenly removed. And they're facing difficulties. They're facing challenges. And so he writes this to encourage them, to strengthen them in the faith, they were confronted with a lot of the philosophies of the day, which is happening still today, but it doesn't seem as evident to us. We look and we read this, we know the Greek thought and the Greek mindset was fascinated with special wisdom and special thought and immortality and this philosophy and that philosophy. So we read that and be like, that's how they were. But what we don't see is it's still exactly like that today. One of the main verses, in my view, of Colossians is 2 verse 8, when it says in the NIV, it says it this way, do not be taken captive through empty and hollow philosophy. Philosophy is something we philosophizing about, if that's a word. It's like a hypothesis. It's a philosophy. It's not yet a doctrine. And what happens is ideas and thoughts and these things that sound wonderful come into a culture, and it's happening now in the United States, things that come in that sound a lot like the truth, sound a lot like love, but when you lean on them, you realize it's a reed, it's empty, it snaps under pressure because the substance is not real. And it creeps its way into churches, and superstition creeps in, and other things creep in. It creeps into the way God's people think, and this was happening in Colossae, and that's exactly what's happening today. He actually says that all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in Jesus Christ. Now, for a Greek mindset, that is a major thing to say. All, not some, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in Jesus Christ. He's saying you don't need any other wisdom because that was their focus, their fascination with wisdom and special knowledge. He said it's all found in Jesus. In a sense, you can learn from other people, but even that wisdom somehow will all come from Jesus Christ. And so he writes this to encourage them, to strengthen them in their faith. We also have to understand that ancient, the ancient world Christianity was very different to today. They faced enormous pressure that a lot of us are not accustomed to. What do I mean by that? If you went into Colossae, if you went into Ephesus, if you went into Lurkus, if you went into Smyrna, if you went into all these ancient Greek cities, you will see that they all worshipped gods and goddesses. 
Yeah, we know that from history. But the way they viewed it was the god and goddesses who were local inhabitants of their city with them. There were two groups of inhabitants, the people and the unseen god and goddesses. They literally, in their mind, they lived there with them. They inhabited that place with them. They were just unseen. And so they had all these processions. They had all these religious rituals. They had all these sacrifices. They had all these marches and processions they used to do. Because the goal was to keep the unseen ones happy. Because when things went bad, they obviously didn't do a good job. In their view, we didn't keep them happy enough. We didn't do the right sacrifice. We didn't do the right procession, the right ritual. And so what happens is when that's going on in the city, and that was normal, that's the way they thought, that's the culture, then along comes someone, Epaphras, from Paul, and goes, there is one true God. So what starts to happen is now you get a bunch of Christians, and there's not privacy then like there is now. Today, you can make a, you can make a, a, a change in some of your spiritual thought. You can, you can change, and God can make an adjustment, or, but it's not like everybody knows. There's a lot of privacy today. There's a lot of you kind of in, the, in your own home and in your own mind, and you speak to just a few people maybe. But in those days, everything was lived out in public. When you made a decision for Christ, everybody knew everybody's business. Now there's a group of people who are not joining the processions. Now there's a group of people who are not doing the sacrifices. They're not joining the rituals. So it's like the neighbors know what's going on. It's not, you know, your neighbors don't know what's going on in your home. They knew what was going on. And what was happening is every bad thing that happens, earthquakes, plagues, pestilences, sickness, crops, any financial, any bad thing that's happened, that happens, was blamed on Christians. Why? Because you stopped keeping the gods happy. Now this bad thing has happened, and they became under extreme scrutiny, pressure, persecution, because it's your fault. It's your fault. Because you decided to worship this one true God, now this happens, it's on them. We don't always know what that's like. We saw some of that in Africa. But it's, it was very real for them. Very, very real. So, also, now, some of the people I'd love you to notice. Epaphras, Anisimus, and... Do you guys say Philemon or Philemon or how? Philemon. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Wasn't even one of the options. All right. I'm going to say Philemon. Can you guys get over that? We'd be friends. We, I knew Philemon's in South Africa. There's a common name. So Philemon, okay, so you guys can take it to the Lord. One day you'll meet him and say, how do you, but not now. So Epaphras was this guy who planted this church, as we already said, out of uh, Acts chapter 19 revival. Enesimus, Enesimus was a slave to this guy Philemon, or Philemon, okay? He was a slave. And what happens is he runs away, which is punishable by death. He leaves. Okay, he leaves slavery, he decides no more, he leaves, now he's under a death sentence, and he goes and gets saved under Paul's preaching. And Paul's in prison, and now Epaphras who started that church is in prison with Paul, and he comes there and he sees Onesimus, this slave of Philemon, who's run away, and he's the slave, and Paul actually writes the book of Philemon and the book of Colossians together, he writes them at the same time, and he sends them back to the church that's in Colossians, which he's never been to, with Onesimus, the slave, who was a runaway slave, and Tychius, this guy Tychius. And he sends, so he takes this man and he writes a book, to, he writes a letter to, to Philemon and talks about Onesimus and says, receive him back as you would a brother. He's no longer a slave to you. Anything you, he owes you, charge to my account. And he actually says, I won't... <laughs> Talk about passive-aggressive. He says, I won't mention that you owe me your own soul. That's what he says. <laughs> I won't mention it, but he, he mentions it. That's in the Bible. He says, I won't mention that you owe me your soul. And he sends Onesimus with a letter to his ex-slave owner. And so Onesimus would have given him the letter. Before you kill me, read this. <laughs> to some degree. So these two letters went back. One of them Colossians and one of them... Um, Philemon. So let's go 
read the last part, the part that a lot of people kind of skiff over. The last part, verse 7 to 18 of chapter 4, it says, Tychius, that's the guy who took the letters with Onesimus, a beloved brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts. With Onesimus, in other words, he's coming, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. But he had actually done something illegal in those days and in that culture. They will make known to you all the things which are happening here. Aristarchus, the next three people he mentions, are the only Jews that were with Paul. Aristarchus, my fellow prisoner, greets you with Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. That's the guy who wrote the Gospel of Mark. About whom you received instructions. If he comes to you, welcome him. And Jesus, who is called Justice. These are my only fellow workers for the kingdom of God who are of the circumcision. In other words, they were born Jewish. They have proved to be a comfort to me. <coughs> Epaphras the guy who started that church, who is one of you, a bondservant of Christ, greets you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers. How did he know that? Well, he was in prison with Paul. So Paul's not lying. This is Holy Scripture. So he's in prison with this guy, and he sees this guy praying and praying and praying and praying and praying for this group of people that got saved out of his ministry. Talk about an apostolic heart. And he says... Um, always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand witness, so that you may stand perfect and complete in the will of God. For I bear him witness that he has a great zeal for you and for those in Laodicea and those in Hierapolis. Luke, that's the writer of the Gospel of Luke, the beloved physician and Demas greet you. Demas eventually deserted Paul later on. And greet the brethren who are in Laodicea and Nymphos and the church that is in his house. Now when the epistle, when this epistle is read among you, see that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. That's a lost letter. We don't have that. And say to Archippus, take heed to the ministry to which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. It's a pretty direct word. This salutation by my own hand, Paul. Remember my chains, grace be with you, amen. That was like a signature. Someone else wrote the rest, he wrote that last sentence because they used to understand handwriting. That was like him saying, it was an authentication. This is my handwriting. All right. So Paul sends this letter, which we're going to read. We're going to read almost two chapters because the Bible says, give yourself to the public reading of Scripture. None of you are even going to get tired. It's going to be wonderful. But Paul... <coughs> Paul sends this to deal with some heresy, some unknown heresy, but they had come into the church. But it was like a blend of Jewish legalism and the early parts of Gnosticism, Greek Gnosticism, which was what? That Jesus wasn't actually divine. Jesus actually wasn't the Son of God. He was like kind of a semi-divine being. And, and obviously that's a major deal. We understand that. But they would have, well, why is that a big deal? Because then he can't actually help you. He can't actually give you authority. He can't actually take the monkey off your back. He can't actually cast the demons out. He can't actually set you free. He can't actually deal with death. He was just this great teacher, this great person, one of these like semi-divine beings like they would have sought, seen Hercules. You know, some of God, some of because he was fully God and fully man and they couldn't because it comes by revelation. And they were trying to figure it out with the human mind. And so they had this Gnosticism, this early Gnosticism coming in. So Paul writes mainly to this church about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. Think about this. If you had never, if you could write one letter to your children, knowing that you weren't going to be around, what would you write? I was thinking about this letter, thinking if I had to ask the leaders, the elders, to write a letter to this church, what would they write? Something that they knew would stand the church instead, in strength, not for the next year. This is timeless. What does he write? He doesn't write about gifts. He doesn't write about any of the things that sometimes people get fascinated by. He writes about Jesus, the supremacy of Jesus, the need for Jesus. So the first two chapters and I know this is a long outline, but it helps as we start to read because it will bring some understanding. The first two chapters, he focuses on the supremacy of Jesus Christ. The next two chapters, 
He focuses on how to outwork that supremacy in my life, how I parent, how I am in my marriage, how I am in life, how I am at work, how that supremacy will start to overtake my heart and actually make it look like on the outside. That's the next two verses. Very, very important. Colossians is also unique there. I think, I think there's 34 words, Greek words in the original, 34 words that are used nowhere else in the New Testament. It's a very wonderful, very wonderful book. So Paul writes about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. Give you a brief overview. He writes that Jesus Christ is Lord over all creation. Colossians is very similar to Ephesians. They were most likely written at the same time. But Ephesians talks a lot about Jesus Christ being Lord of the church. Colossians, he has a stronger point that Christ is Lord over all creation. Secondly, that Jesus is preeminent in the church as its creator and its savior. And that Jesus is supreme in salvation concerning mankind and no other person is. Removing all barriers, all obstacles to the totality of salvation. He talks about the hope of your salvation. That doesn't mean I hope. That means one day when each of us stand before God the Father, then and only then, will we fully understand and recognize and realize the work of the cross because we will suddenly be safe. We will suddenly be fully redeemed. We will suddenly recognize how much Jesus did on your behalf that you couldn't do. And we will stand before the Father as one who is holy, as one who is righteous, as one whose sin has already been judged because it was judged on the cross on your behalf. And you will stand before the Father and then you will realize, wow, that's what he did. And that Christ's supremacy in our own hearts and lives in the outworking of a personal relationship to him. One of the reasons I love the book of Colossians is because who of you have ever made things overcomplicated? In my intensity, I do it frequently. And uh, my wife helps me, you know, kiss, keep it simple, stupid. And, and, and we've made things overcomplicated. And one of the things, Colossians, I encourage you to read it. If you do that, it points out the simplicity of your relationship with Jesus. It's simple. Keep it simple. Keep it basic in Colossians. So we're going to go read Colossians. I put it up behind me. So let's go read. We're gonna, can we read a long, long portion of Scripture here? So this letter is from Paul, chosen by the will of God to be an apostle of Christ Jesus and from our brother Timothy. So Timothy was with him. We are writing to God's holy people in the city of Colossae, who are faithful brothers and sisters in Christ. May God our Father give you grace and peace. We always pray for you. Can we say that? We always pray for you. That's what we're going to talk about today. And we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all of God's people, which come from. Who wants to know what it's like to, you know, sometimes it helps just to learn how to read the Bible. When you see a preposition, from, under, to, because, for, whatever, and some grammar people, I mean, that wasn't a preposition. For me, when I got saved, I don't know why I underlined all of them. Where do things come from? Where does it, well, how does it work? I just wanted to understand. And so when I read something that says, your love, we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, that means you're living out your faith, and your love should have brought in the heart for all of God's people. Then it says, which come from? Well, I want to know what it comes from. Don't you? It comes from your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. Meaning that in the New Testament, in early Christianity, when they preached the gospel, they told them about heaven. Heaven. Today, it's obviously we all believe in heaven, but you don't hear it as much. You don't hear this focus on heaven, on the, what they would have called the afterlife, on the eternity, on what comes next. They were accustomed in their Greek world making decisions for the now because of what I don't yet understand. Because of what's coming next, I make decisions now because it'll impact then. When, the, when these guys heard the gospel, they heard about heaven, not just that Jesus takes away your sins. And that's not a just, that's, a, that's the big deal. But what tends to happen is if that's all you hear, man becomes at the center of the gospel instead of Jesus. 
and they heard of heaven. So when they went through difficulty, they were encouraged and strengthened because they knew there's something coming. Heaven, you know, heaven. How often do you think of heaven? It was about three years ago, God gripped my heart for heaven. And I just started under, just reading and studying and learning just heaven. Paul had been there. He says that. He went to the third heaven. He actually says in Philippians, it is my desire to depart and to be with the Lord. Some people today would call that depression, suicidal thoughts. It wasn't. He had been to heaven. He said, I desire to depart, in other words, to die, and to be with the Lord, which is better by far. But it's for your sake that I will remain. Heaven. Because when eternity grips your heart, it seems to strengthen how you live out your life here, as it just said. And it seems to strengthen your faith because of eternity. That's what it says. And then he says, which come from our confident, your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. You have had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the gospel or the good news. This same good news came to you, that came to you, is going out all over the world. It is bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives. Just, see, it's not bearing fruit by how many people got saved. It's not bearing fruit by we had, a, we had a thing and 400 people got saved and they all filled out a ticket. I'm sorry to step on people's toes. And we were like, it's not about the number. It's bearing fruit by lives being changed. Practical change. All over the world, just as it has changed your life, your lives, from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. What changes your life? The truth of God's wonderful grace. The scandalous truth that a righteous God will justify the wicked. That you will be treated as if you lived his life because he was treated as if he lived yours. That truth got a hold of them in Colossian, in the Colossian church. And they started to be free. Genuinely free. With all the philosophy, with all the just like today, your truth. Well, this is my truth and that's your truth. No! No! No, a thousand times no. I get passionate, but you love me still. Verse 7, you learned about the good news from Epaphras. See, he planted the church. A beloved co-worker. He is Christ's faithful, minister, his faithful servant, and he is helping us on your behalf. He has told us about the love for others that the Holy Spirit has given you. So we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of His will, to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord. Not do this, do this, do this, listen to this rule, be like this, not outward modification. We pray that God will reveal to you His heart and His will. Personally, it's a revelation because the outward work of that is a changed life. Not outside in, inside out. Okay? It's all here in the Bible. It's amazing when you read the Bible. Look at, look at that. Then the way you live will always honor and please the Lord. <coughs> Excuse me. And your lives will produce every kind of good fruit. All the while, you will grow as you learn to know God better and better. We also pray that you will be strengthened with all His glorious power. So you will have endurance and patience you need. You will need patience. My son says to me the other day, we're talking about patience. He goes, you know, patience is hard. That's a hard one. And I said, yeah, that's still learning patience. It's a hard one. And, you know, we all heard it. I think it was, I can't remember who said it, some actor in some movie, but it, it's actually true. When you pray for patience, God doesn't make you patient. He gives you opportunities to demonstrate patience. So he said to me, well, then I'm not going to pray for patience. That's what he said to me. So, uh, verse 12. Um, patience you need. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father. He has enabled you. Say that. He has enabled you. The, King, the New King James says, Forgive thanks to the Father who has qualified you 
to be partakers in the inheritance of the sons of the light. He says, He has enabled you. He qualified you, not you. Not you, not what you did, not your good works. He has enabled. He has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to His people who live in the light. For He has rescued us. Dwayne read it this morning. He has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us, conveyed us into the kingdom of His dear Son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Now, these next few verses. Oh, good. Goodness gracious. Look at the time. These next few verses talk very briefly about the supremacy of Jesus Christ. But it's broken into two parts. And I'm going to do this as fast as I can because I want to talk about prayer a little bit. You can close your eyes. You don't have to. I w it, sometimes it helps people to, to visualize something or to focus on something. The next few verses, understand this is a Greek area. He starts to paint this picture of Jesus. And I'd like it, if you could, to imagine not our picture of Jesus having grown up in the church and everything. He's writing to Greek mythologists, people who had that as the history, and he starts to paint this picture of the God of gods. And he starts to paint this picture of Jesus Christ outside of you and me, outside of salvation, outside of just Jesus. And he says this, Christ, Jesus Christ, is the visible image of the invisible God. He's the part of the God that you can see and touch. So try to picture that. And he existed before anything was created, and he is supreme over all creation. For through him, through Jesus, God created, and you need to ask yourself if you actually know this and believe this, through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on the earth. Jesus through Christ, creation happened because of Jesus. And what does it say? In the heavenly realms and on the earth. Not just the earth, not just you, not just people. The unseen. Jesus made that. He made the things we can see, he being Jesus, and the things we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. He existed before anything else, and he holds all things together. And that is him writing to people who are having this heresy come in that he's semi-divine. And he said, you don't understand. Even the things you can't see. He didn't just make you. Friends, we need to hear this today in our modern world. He didn't just make you. There's an unseen world. He made that too. And to people who understood, today in the East, if you go to the East, you have to preach who is God. They understand there's a supernatural realm. They understand there's demons and powers and authorities. You have to preach who is God. In the West, you have to preach there is a God. And he's writing to these people that understand that. And he said, he is in charge of it all. Which does what? Don't worry and live in fear about what those things will come and do to you. Because he's supreme over it all. And then he goes on to tell them, and that supreme God is inside you. And to agree, they're like, what? He's not just over there and we worship. No, he lives inside you. Which then, how can those things affect you? If you let them, if you believe them, sure. It says here in verse 18, Christ is also. So now he zooms in. He's that, apart from you, without you. Now he zooms in and talks about you. Christ is also the head of the church, which is his body. He is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. Meaning, what happened to him will happen to you. If he rose, you rose. It's like that song. If he walked out of the grave, I'm walking too. I think it was Johnny Cash wrote that song. I love Johnny Cash. Anyway, he is the beginning, supreme over all who rise from the dead. So he is first in everything. For God in all his fullness was pleased 
to live in Christ. My dad spoke last week about hosting the Lord. And I know here it's talking about the fact that the full, of, the full power and the, full, the Godhead dwelt in Christ. It's a doctrinal point to understand. But also in the Greek it means this, that he, God, was pleased to live in Christ. And when I read that, I asked myself, God, are you pleased to live in me? <laughs> he was pleased to live in Christ. Christ hosted God perfectly. He was pleased to live in Christ, and through him, God reconciled, through him, through Jesus Christ, God reconciled everything to himself. It doesn't say everyone. It says everything. Heavens, the unseen, the universe, the universes, the stars, the planets, creation. He reconciled everything to himself through Jesus Christ. How? He made peace with everything in heaven and on earth by the means of Christ's blood on the cross. I don't know if the church can fathom and understand the power of what took place on the cross of Jesus Christ. Because we put us at the center. Paul is writing to this group of people saying, you've got to understand the heavens, the stars, creation, the rivers demons, they all bow to Jesus and he is in you because they left without a leader, their leaders in prison and Epaphras is going Paul help me, what do I do with these people that are encountering all this other truth and all this other stuff and Paul writes about the supremacy of Jesus so I was going to read more but we're going to stop there because we actually have to g I want to give you some helpful things about prayer Go back to verse 3. I'm going to do this as fast as I can. I want to issue a prayer challenge today. I know it's 11.32. I'm very aware of the time. Don't worry. But I want to in issue a, ch a prayer challenge. Paul says in, in, in verse 3 of chapter 1, we, him, we, we being him and Timothy, he says, we always pray for you. We always pray for you. And I know we're going to get into the supremacy of Christ and the stuff and the meat of all of that next week. But he says, we always pray for you. And the Lord put it in my heart to quickly issue a prayer challenge. How many of you have ever been taught the power of or have ever heard about, I'm sure you have, actually not just prayer in terms of going and presenting your requests and supplications to the Lord, which is scriptural, but actually taking a piece of scripture and praying the Bible. It has phenomenal authority and power to pray the Bible. This is honestly happening in my own heart because I have two children. And I pray for them, but sometimes I don't know what to pray for them. There's so much. And so I want to issue a very quick prayer challenge that you can go home and use the first couple verses of Colossians. And I'm asking you as your pastor, so to speak, to actually try this. To go home and to take these verses, if you can, every day for a week or every second day for a month, however long, just it's a challenge because I, it's kind of a secret way to get you to read the Bible. But it's a challenge because it has tremendous authority and power and you will start to see things turn. Because when we pray the Bible, we're coming into agreement with something that already has authority. So... He says, we always pray for you. Now, Paul called these people, they were like his children. And so, there's a prayer challenge to go and pray some of the things, the practical things I'm going to very quickly give you that you can take straight out of this and go sit down and start to pray. It doesn't just have to be for your children. Specifically, anyone you have authority over. Your employees, if you, if you own a business, your children, your spouse, because you, you go back and forth with authority, your spouse, yourself, Oh boy, yourself. And anyone you're in relationship with. Anyone you touch sides with. Anyone that you know. Anyone, and you can actually take these things and begin to pray for them. So, can we look at it real quick? Um, firstly, he says here, we always pray for you and give you thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, very quickly outline for a prayer challenge and I, and, we, and I know I've said this and we, I will I've already typed up these notes for the office if you want them you can email the office 
But how do you begin to take a portion of scripture, sit down and begin to pray this for somebody else? Number one, he says, we give thanks. Very simple. Sit down, read the verse. We give thanks for them. And give thanks for them and then for what God is already doing in their life. What does he go on to say? He goes on to say, we give thanks to God. We've heard of your faith. We've heard of your love. You had this expectation. It's just, it's already changed your life. In other words, you're a little bit aware, and maybe you're not, but if you're aware of some of the things that God has already started to do in their life, thank God for them and thank God for what he's already begun. This is a very practical tool. Thank God, I've, I asked my wife, can we do this every night this week? And she accepted. She said, all right, we'll do this every night this week for my own children. Thank God for what he is doing. Because then you're partnering with him. You're not just saying, God, make them like this. God, change them like this. God, do this. But maybe God's not doing that yet. Thank God for what he is already doing. That's what Paul says. Number two, very quickly. Pray for a revelation of the gospel. Where do I get that? Verse 4. You have had this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. Ask the Lord. Pray for whoever you're praying for, for yourself. I pray for myself all the time. Give me a profound revelation of the basics. It's not special knowledge. It's not, oh, they have some special revelation. No, it's a profound understanding of the basics. Things like the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus, the word of Jesus. That's all. It comes by revelation here. So you can take this, you can read it, you can say literally, you have had this expectation, you read the verse 4, and then you pray. Say, Lord, give whoever, give myself, give my children a profound understanding, bring a revelation to their heart about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul says, the gospel was not taught to me by any man. I received it by revelation of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, I hope this is helpful. He says what? Verse 7, you have learned about the good news from Epaphras. Pray for godly influences. You know, you can pray for that. Pray for godly influences in their life. I have all these stories I could tell you about I have amazing parents. I'm blessed to have wonderful parents. But it was often not them who brought me to the point of decision and impact. It was other people. Because even in natural life, you have coaches, you have aunts, you have uncles, you have grandparents, you have... Those people all play a role. A coach, a father cannot, unless he is the coach, a father can't do what a coach can do. Pray for godly influences in the life of the people you pray for. Pray for godly influence in your life. Pray for mothers and fathers, for people who don't have any. Pray for Christian mothers and fathers. Pray for godly influence. It has profound impact. My mother used to pray this for me. And there was a man who came along by the name of Mark. And that man helped me. Pulled me out of the gutter. Used to come and train in my disgusting, terrible, dirt-filled gym in my little garage when he was the top trainer in the biggest gym in the area. He humbled himself. To, I didn't even think about it. I was a teenager. Well, I don't know. He used to come and train with me there instead of asking me to go into his world. He came to my world. And he used to talk to me. Just not pushing. Just be with me. Number four, verse eight. It says here, he has told us about the love that the Holy Spirit has given you. Very practical. Pray for the love of God to be put in their heart. Romans 5 says that when you get saved, that the Holy Spirit will shed abroad the love of God in your heart. Pray that. Pray it for yourself. When I got saved, I prayed this every day. Well, not every, every time I prayed, I could say, truthfully, I would cry out to God, God put a love for you in my heart. Because I say I love you, but I don't feel like I do. And I, God put a love in my heart for you, put a love in my heart for you. And over time, this love for the Lord started to... But now you can pray this for others too. That's what he says. It's in the Bible. I can pray for my children. God put a love for them in their hearts. Put a love for you in their hearts. Put a love for others. If there's a tension relationship, pray God. Put a love in their relationships. Put the God type of love. You can pray this. It's you praying along with the Bible. Almost closing. 
Can I quickly explain something? This is not the only thing that prayer does. Let me quickly explain this. Friends, when you pray for someone, think about this. Paul's in prison. He couldn't get there, but he prayed for them. He saw his friend pray for them. They, he wrote scripture. He had been to heaven. If anyone understands the power of a believer praying, it's this man. When you pray for them, who knows that when you're being stupid or you're seeing a person who's making bad decisions, and it's like who knows that feeling of every once in a while you have this, this thought, this something that comes up in a person's heart, and it's like this opportunity almost to turn aside and make a good choice. You like you see it pop up in a person's heart. They're like they have this brief, sometimes it's brief, seconds. They have this thought, this sudden opportunity to like, I could do this. And it's like they have that little moment. Do I turn aside to it and choose it or do I not? When you're praying for someone, that opportunity comes up over and over and over and over and over and over. Not just one. When you're praying for someone, that thought, that God thought, that you are working with the Holy Spirit, and it comes up into their heart. It like makes freedom within reach. It makes a good decision within reach. That's actually what happens. It's like the Holy Spirit hounds them when you're praying for them, and something comes up in their heart over and over and over and over and over. And some people are really dense. So it takes a lot of times. <laughs> like this man, Paul. He had to get knocked off his high horse. Hello. So, very quickly. Pray for the will of God to be known. Number next. Take that from verse 9. Take the verse. We have not stopped praying for you. We ask God. He's telling you what he prays for new believers, for people who are dealing with difficulty. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will. Oh, read it, then do it. Lord, I ask you, you, I can't, I can't, I could preach a thousand years to my children, but he can put a desire. What is, happens in a person's heart when a young person starts to have this desire? Man, what does it mean to know the will of God for my life? Ask God to put it in there. Ezra 7 said that. He said he set his heart to seek the law and to do it. Two more very quick. Pray for spiritual wisdom and understanding. Verse 9, we have not stopped praying for you since we first heard about you. We ask God to give you complete knowledge of his will and to give you spiritual wisdom and understanding. You see how easy it is when you read the Bible. It tells you what to do. It's amazing. It's like right there. It's really amazing. He says, I ask God, you can pray for people. You can pray for God. Think about this. Does God want to give people spiritual wisdom and understanding? Then why did Paul have to pray it? Oh, oh. I don't know. But Paul understood, I'm going to partner with God's desire. And I'm going to pray for them to receive something that God already wants them to receive. But my prayer matters. I'm going to pray for them to receive spiritual wisdom and understanding. Not lofty, special, supernatural. Just meaning what? To have a lens that thinks from the spirit realm, not from the earthly one. To see things from God's perspective. You know what? We'll leave it there. There's one more big deal, but I want to be able to say I didn't, I didn't finish. So... We're going to get into this book of Colossians. There's history. There's, it's a wonderful book. And uh, I encourage you to go home and read it. But you can take these things, you can, and we'll send them out if you want them, but you can take these things and actually begin to pray. If Paul prayed for the church this way, you can pray this way. You can take them verse by verse. Say, read it and pray it for your children, for yourself, for your spouse. I challenge you, I ask you to do that this week. It doesn't have, you don't have to go through each one. Take one of them. Just one of them for five minutes and pray that for your children. Pray that for your spouse. Pray that for your boss, for your employees. 
write a list of people. People sometimes get so over, like, they're like, I'm going to pray for each thing for every person. And it takes six hours. So they do it once. Write a list of all the people. I do this frequently. And I will physically take that list and I hold it up to the Lord. It's not like he doesn't know, but it's a way for me to release my faith. And I hold it up saying, Lord, I pray this for these people. A little easier. And then God will move your heart for the one. So you zoom into the one. Can we stand? I hope that's helpful. We'll get into it next week. Yep. Amen and amen. Tommy, can I hand over to you? Can we pray? And then I'll hand over to Tommy, actually. Heavenly Father, we pray make this word come alive in us. Give us revelation as a beep, as a people, as a church, from your word. And I pray that Colossians comes alive in our heart. In Jesus' name.